As the year 1899 rolled around in southern Africa, the dogs of war began to bark loudly and incessantly. The agitators on both sides agitated for war. On the British part, Cecil John Rhodes lobbied in London, uh, demanding that the republics be annexed uh, in order to complete the dream of the rail line from Cape Town to Cairo. The Hawks in the War Office, the officers and the general staff, they wanted war, they wanted revenge. Remember Majuba became the rallying call for the troops. And that was noted that the Boers were now building a railway line from Pretoria to Delgoa Bay in the Mozambique, the Portuguese province, which would deny British uh, interests the taxation and customs from using their ports. The gold strike in the Witwaters Runt was proving to be the richest gold strike uh, in the world at the time, and South Africa for many years would contribute the major part of gold to the economies of the world. Uh, they were deep mines that needed extensive investment to uh, sink shafts, and the Boers were quick to add a, uh, uh, a taxation on dynamite, which was unpopular. The cause of the eight Londers was a cause celebre amongst uh, British politicians at the time, Lord Gladstone, Lord Salisbury, and they continually lobbied and, and pressed the Boers to make changes and, and to give the eight Londers uh, a vote. The Boers, in return, in an, in an attempt to placate the demands, dropped the requirement from 14 years of uh, inhabiting the Transvaal to four years and then to two years. Uh, this still was not enough. Uh, Paul Kruger travelled to London uh, to negotiate with the British but refused to discuss the internal affairs of the South African Republic uh, with the British. The Transvaal and the Orange Free State signed a military alliance in 1897 which stated they would protect each other if either were attacked. Uh, the future Prime Minister and a Boer leader, uh, Jan Smuts, wrote in 1906, the Jamison raid was the real declaration of war, and that is so in spite of the four years of truce that followed. The aggressors consolidated their alliance. The defenders, on the other hand, silently and grimly prepared for the inevitable. And indeed, in the months before the declaration of war, uh, burghers were called to all the main towns in the Transvaal and the Orange Free State where they were issued with the Mauser rifles purchased from Germany. The rifles were bought by the local burghers or inhabitants at cost price and could be returned uh, at the end of the war and their money redeemed. Commandos were formed and it was accepted as inevitable that the republics would go to war. All across towns and districts in the Boer republics, notices were put up and proclamations made for uh, meetings. And Boers rode in from all over the, the landscape, uh, some boys as young as 13, burghers they were called, uh, the citizens of the Boer republics. Uh, they were gathered and they were uh, told that war was coming and the new Mauser rifles purchased by the government were issued to them at cost price. War fever and excitement ran through the districts. The Boers thought that they surely must win. They had God on their side and they had beaten the British once before. The Boer commandos could be raised quickly and were extremely mobile on small uh, ponies that the Boers had, had bred spe specifically for conditions in South Africa. However, there was no real formal leadership. The Boer uh, leaders or the commandants of the commandos could implore with their fellow burghers to, uh, to attack or to retreat, but they couldn't force them to do anything that the burghers didn't wish to do. Uh, the burghers or the Boers uh, 
obeyed commands as 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 long as it suited them, uh, but would often uh, drift off and leave the uh, the field of battle uh, or campaign to head back to do farm work or to reconnect with their families. And uh, as such, uh, the commander was a, was a a fluid group of men. On the 9th of October, 1899, after consulting with uh, President Stain of the Orange Free State, President Paul Kruger sent an ultimatum to the British, giving them 48 hours to withdraw all troops from the border and to turn around the troop ships that were on their way from Britain to South Africa. When the ultimatum expired, the Boers invaded uh, Natal and the Cape Province. They laid siege to the towns of Ladysmith in Natal, uh, Mafeking and uh, Kimberley, the diamond centre in the Cape Province. Uh, Initially, they had great success and there was some feeling and hope amongst the Boers that their brothers, their brethren that they'd left behind in the Cape Province would also rise and uh, join the cause. Uh, In some cases, some locals did Uh, but many other Boers in the Cape were quite content with British rule. The Second Anglo-Boer War consisted of three phases, the first phase being a traditional uh, phase of war, where the British troops arriving under Sir Redvers Buller attempted to relieve the besieged towns. Starting in Natal, Buller's force uh, went to the relief of Ladysmith and Uh, Troops from the Cape Province began uh, their march towards Kimberley to relieve uh, that besieged town. Uh, And we see here what is known as Black Week, where a series of engagements with the Boers, the British were resoundingly thrashed to great loss. Uh, Battles such as Colenso, Stormberg, uh, Muggersfontein saw... Uh, British losses exceeding uh, by far those of the Boers. The Boers uh, having shown themselves to be uh, excellent strategists and fighters and putting those uh, Mausers to good use. The public back in uh, Britain were shocked and surprised that a group of farmers could uh, uh, inflict defeats on the mighty British army and what was uh, thought of being an, as an easy conquest was now seen as uh, being a serious challenge. And so word went out to the colonies uh, uh, of Britons, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, India, uh, that there, there may be a need for uh, colonial troops. Uh, those that came from India uh, were not to be fighting troops, however, as uh, even in the midst of war, They considered the Boers to be white people and did not want Indian troops firing on white people. Uh, For the Boers, who garnished a lot of sympathy throughout Europe and indeed Britain, uh, recruits came from Ireland, uh, some from England, America, Russia, uh, some from Australia even. The second phase of the war was uh, where the, uh, the balance of power tipped in favour of the British. The Boers could only ever uh, field around 30,000 uh, fighting men, including the boys that joined their fathers and brothers, and they tended uh, to drift off as the seasons changed for, for needing to do uh, farm work or to see their families. So time was not on the side of the Boers and laying siege to towns was a lengthy uh, time-wasting experience, especially uh, towns like Mafeking, where uh, the world's attention was turned to the relief of Mafeking. Uh, uh, Boers were tied up uh, during these siege operations, which enabled the British to build up their forces. Uh, they had become frust- the British had become frustrated with Red Vizbulla, uh and his stalling at the Battle of Spienkop and retreat back to uh, across the Tugela River. And Lady Stiff, Lady Smith remained under siege. So Lord Roberts was sent, the the hero of 
Kandahar, and he was to take over the advance uh, up through the interior towards the Boer capitals of uh, Bloemfontein and Pretoria. It was felt that once the capitals were taken, then surely the war would be over. The Boers experienced their first major defeat at the Battle of Paderberg, where General Kronja uh, slowed up with uh, wagons of supplies and women and children and uh, the cattle were caught at, uh, at the Orange River and were formed in a horseshoe arrangement, which the British uh, laid siege to. And after uh, nearly a week of shelling, the white flag went up and General Kronja and around about 3,000 uh, Boer fighters plus the women and children surrendered. Kronja and the Boers were sent to uh, Ceylon uh, for the duration of the war. The might of the British army now rolled on towards the Boer capitals. What followed were a long series of what would better be called skirmishes, which tended to follow the same format. The Boers would establish themselves on the high ground, usually a copy. They would hold up the British advance. The British would storm the copy, taking losses, inflicting losses on the Boers with their artillery. And then the Boers would retreat, jump on their ponies, gallop off and repeat the process all the way up until Bloemfontein and Pretoria. And by early uh, 1900, by mid-1900, the capitals were, uh, were captured and the Union Jack was raised in Pretoria. President Kruger fled the uh, South African Republic when Pretoria was captured. He took the train across to Delgoa Bay and was given uh, exile in Holland initially, taken aboard a, a Dutch steamer. Uh, back to Holland where he was greeted with rapturous crowds. The old man never saw uh, his beloved South Africa again. He died in exile a number of years after the end of the Boer War. It was now considered that the war would be over uh, by mid-1900 and General Roberts, uh, who had lost his only son at the Battle of Colenso, uh, was recalled and replaced by Lord Kitchener, his chief of staff. Now, this is now known as the third phase of the war, which in some ways was the most savage and the most brutal, and it dragged on. It became a guerrilla war, which dragged on to uh, 1902. Initially, uh, Kitchener thought that the Boers could be captured and the war ended, but they proved to be elusive. They could live off the land. Uh, Boer commanders like uh, General De Vett, uh, Smuts, uh, often ran uh, rings around great amounts of British troops that were slow moving and reliant on uh, supply wagons and hit and run guerrilla attacks began to uh, inflict losses on the British. Uh, as well as the Boer attacks, the British lost a lot of men through uh, dysentery and enteric fever and uh, Kitchener began to employ uh, techniques and tactics uh, designed to uh, eliminate the supplies that the Boers were being um, uh, and the support the Boers were receiving from uh, the uh, women and children, the Boer families that were still on the farms. So he began using troops to burn Boer farms. Uh, he built a series of uh, blockhouses, small uh, forts that held half a dozen British troops with lengths of barbed wire between them, uh, easily defended, and they were able to communicate between the blockhouses at short intervals in an attempt to cut off the Boers uh, using uh, the land to escape and to uh, traverse across. When that was having limited effect, the most controversial 
was the establishment of uh, concentration camps where Boer women and children and, and old people were uh, put in these camps and kept until uh, disease started to break out and there is a lot of grief in South Africa even today over the losses of the women and children through disease whilst kept in concentration camps. A new word was given to uh, the English language. Word filtered back to Britain of the condition of the men and women and elderly Boers in these concentration camps and a a delegation was formed to investigate firsthand the conditions and a woman named uh, Emily Hobhouse, who was a delegate to a fund for the women and children of South Africa, uh, reported back to the Houses of Parliament on the grim conditions in these camps. Um, upwards of 18,000 to 30,000 were to lose their lives through starvation and disease. Uh, of course, the majority of these being Europeans raised a great amount of sympathy in Britain and public opinion turned against the Boer War. On the felt, the fighters, the commandos, were being starved out by the scorched earth policy of Kitchener and many of them uh, did come in under white flags of truce. Uh, some would surrender and then take up arms again, but uh, day by day the number of fighters on the felt was diminishing. Those that wished to fight until the very end were known as the bitter enders. On May the 31st of 1902 a peace treaty was signed at Vereniging in the Transvaal. Uh, it was a fairly lenient uh, peace offered to the Boers. The British were uh, exhausted in funds and in men, and uh, were keen not to punish the Boers too harshly in case uh, war would uh, flare up again. Of note was uh, there was no uh, mention of uh, the vote being given to um, the African peoples, but the conditions are for the settlement are as follows. All Boer fighters of both republics had to give themselves up. All combatants would be disarmed everyone to swear allegiance to the Crown, no death penalties would be dealt out, a general amnesty would apply, the use of Dutch would be allowed in the schools and law courts, and eventually the Transvaal and Orange Free State would be given self-government. Uh, the Boers would be paid uh, three million pound in reconstruction aid, the property rights of the Boers would be respected, no land taxes would be introduced and registered private guns would be allowed. The war was over. The South African Boer War Memorial at Bathurst, New South Wales. The monument commemorates those who served in the South African Boer War from 1899 to 1902. It was unveiled by Lord Kitchener and is a cupola with four supporting sandstone lions. Surmounts an arched sandstone structure with an enclosed bronze figure of an Australian soldier with a rifle at the ready. Four columns at the extremities complete the classical centre section with the whole resting upon a base of grey granite blocks. Additional names were added to the monument in the 1960s, including that of Lieutenant Peter Hancock, executed by order of a British court-martial. Hancock, along with Harry Breaker Morant, were convicted of shooting Boer prisoners. Story was popularised in the 1979 film Breaker Morant. There is a folk story in Bathurst that General Kitchener refused to unveil the monument in 1910 until the name of Lieutenant Peter Hancock, a local man, was removed. Hancock had been executed along with Breaker Morant in the Boer War after being found guilty of murder. The two claimed they were following orders, Kitchener's orders. Kitchener did indeed unveil the monument on the occasion of a brief visit to Bathurst, part of an extended tour to investigate and report on Australian uh, defences. He did not, however, insist on the removal of Hancock's uh, name, for his name was not on the monument. Uh, this is from the Goulburn 
Evening Penny Post, New South Wales, dated the 5th of October 1909. The erection of the Bathurst Soldiers Memorial, or that portion of it covered by the present contract, will be completed tomorrow. The memorial, which occupies a site on the William Street end of Market Square in the centre of the city, consists of four arches out of solid stone built upon a granite basin superimposed by a copper dome, housing a life-size bronze figure of a soldier at the ready. Upon the front of the monument, immediately above the foundation stone, is a large bronze plate bearing the names of the 90 residents of the district who served in the South African War, including the four who lost their lives. The present contract cost £650, or about £10 in excess of the amount of money in hand, and to make the memorial complete, the expenditure of another £150 will be necessary. This is for the construction of a raised circular plateau, two foot high and 60 foot in diameter, with four flights of white steps. An effort is being made to secure Lord Kitchener to perform the opening ceremony. Lord Kitchener arrived in Bathurst on Monday afternoon. He remained about four hours, but during that time continued with his restless energy to listen to addresses of welcome, make a few remarks himself, review the senior and junior cadets and veterans, present the Empire Cups and trophies won by the Bathurst Civilian Rifle Club, uh, dine with Mr Jago Smith, MLC, and also to perform what will be the unique, unique ceremony during his flying trip through Australia, viz the unveiling of a memorial to the men from Bathurst who fought and fell in South Africa. Uh, that was from the Malong Argus, New South Wales, 14th of January 1910. Uh, the monument. The front inscription. Unveiled by Lord Kitchener, January the 10th, 1910. The plaque. The honour of the Bathurst men who served in the 1899 South African War to 1902. Names. In memory of those who gave their lives for the empire. Names. This stone was laid by... Uh, Old F. B. Kenny Mayor, nineteen oh nine.